We are uh, continuing our study through the book of Ephesians tonight. We have two classes left. We have tonight and we have next week uh, to finish this great book. A lot of, uh, a lot of good and uh, just rich material left for us to uh, cover. We're going to, we're going to try to get into chapter 6 tonight. I don't know if we'll make it all the way through verse 9 or not. That's sort of the goal, and we'll see if we're able to achieve that and uh, make next week a little bit uh, uh, more reasonable and how much we're, get, we're going to try to cover. Uh, but uh, I hope that this study has been beneficial to you and, and your appreciation for God's Word uh, and your appreciation for the church. Uh, that's, the, that's the theme of the book of Ephesians. The one word theme of this book uh, is that it's about the church and uh, God's eternal plan to establish His church uh, and to take all of uh, His redeemed people and bring them into His one church uh, in order that they might be one in Christ and uh, so these last three chapters of the book, chapters 4, 5, and 6, really uh, are very practical. Uh, there's a lot of information here that just says, here's what you need to do in your daily life uh, as you're a part of the Lord's church. And uh, hopefully some of this has already been helpful to us, and maybe a little challenging in some sense, uh, of what we need to do as a part of the Lord's church. So uh, let me turn my remote on, and here's the, here's the outline we're kind of following. Let me get back to it. Uh, the first three chapters, that doctrinal section on uh, the fact that uh, the church is a part of God's eternal plan. And then these last three chapters, the very practical section. And uh, where we are tonight, as uh, we started chapter 5 last week and uh, introduced this section, is the, the fact that we are supposed to be imitating Christ uh, in our walk with the Lord. And that's how chapter 5 begins, uh, is to imitate God as dear children is what chapter 5 and verse 1 says. And it talks about how much Jesus loved the church and then calls upon us uh, as his children uh, to do all that we can to strive to imitate him. And uh, we, we talked about various points uh, as we went through this, uh, but I think it's interesting to look at how in verse 2, if you back up into chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, how he introduces this word walk and how we are to walk in love. You get to chapter 5 and verse 8, and he talks about how we are to walk, uh, be, uh, how our walk is to be in light. We are to walk as children of light. And then you get down to verse 15, and he uses that word walk again, and talks about the fact that we're to walk circumspectly, we're to walk carefully, uh, and uh, he says we're to walk wisely. So kind of three sections of this chapter, if you want to divide it up that way. There's the walk of love as a Christian, where uh, we're to put others ahead of ourselves, and uh, to... Uh, express that Christ-like love for them. There's the walk of light as a Christian, which means we're, we, we are, uh, the world is full of darkness, and yet here we are as children of light. We're not to be, uh, we're not to, uh, as he says in chapter 5 and verse 11, we're not to have fellowship with these works of darkness. Chapter 5 verse 7 says we're not to be partakers with them. As children of light, we're supposed to be set apart and different uh, from the darkness that's in the world. And in fact, uh, our light and the light of the gospel should, uh, should expose the darkness of the world. And then we are in this section down in verse 15 where as Christians we're not only to have a walk of love and a walk of light, but to have a walk of wisdom, uh, that we are supposed to be wise in our walk as Christians. So he says in verse 15, See that you walk circumspectly, or your Bible might say carefully. Don't walk as fools, but as wise. Where does wisdom, where, if we're supposed to walk as wise, where does this wisdom come from? We, we, we got to come to the Word of God. Are we sure about that? Well, we keep reading. Verse 16 says, as we walk in wisdom, we are to be those who are redeeming the time, making the most uh, use, the best use of our time as God's children, uh, and uh, making sure uh, that we uh, take every opportunity we can to serve Him because the days... Uh, are evil. So that's about as far as we got last week. What's, what's the first word? What's the first word you've got in verse 17? You got therefore? So. The word so means basically the same thing as word therefore. It is, it is, a, it is a word that is drawing some conclusions. It is drawing some uh, application to what's been said. He's saying we need to walk in wisdom, not walk as fools aimlessly, uh, just doing whatever we want to do. We need to walk in wisdom. Uh, 
uh, that uh, we need to make sure that we're taking, making the most use of our opportunities. So he says in verse 17, Therefore, don't be unwise. Don't be senseless uh, in the way that you are walking, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So when I asked you, how do we, where does wisdom come from? Here it is in verse 17. It comes from knowing what the will of the Lord is. So you read verse 17. Verse 17 says, it's, it's a command. The, the word understand there is, is an imperative. It is a command of God telling Christians, you must understand what the will of the Lord is. What, what does that say to you? What does that imply to you? It, it's important. Is God's will understandable? How, how many times have you heard individuals say, well, you know, it's just, I'm not sure that we can really understand the Bible. Well, what does this verse tell us to do? Understand it. Is, if we're told to do something, if we're told to do something, does God give us the means by which to do what he tells us to do? He gives us the ability to do that. Did he give us a book that could be understandable itself? So we've got an understandable book, and he gave us the brain that's in our head to be able to understand the understandable book. And so that's our responsibility as Christians is to get into this. Uh, and, and it's interesting. What's the first word you have in chapter 6 and verse 1? Chapter 6, verse 1, first word. Children. Who is he talking to in chapter 6, verse 1? Chapter 6, verse 1. So what's the first word? Children. Who is he talking to in that verse? Children. Children. He's talking to children. Were they supposed to be able to understand that verse? He's talking to children. Are they supposed to be able to understand that verse? Or is he just putting something out there that children, children couldn't understand? Can children understand the Bible? Why do we have Bible classes if they can't understand the Bible? Why do you talk about it in your home if they can't understand the Bible? Uh, you know, it... Our, our children go to school and they can, they can understand quantum physics and for some reason we, can't, we, we get the idea that they can't understand Jesus loves us, uh, this we know. Uh, the Bible is something that can be understandable and it's not just that we can understand the Bible, but what does verse 17 say? Understand what the will of the Lord is. That's what we, under, that's what we get when we come to the Bible. And so here's, here's God's will that's objective. What's the word before the word will in verse 17? You have the word the? Here's an objective will. Here's an objective truth uh, that we can understand that God's given to us. Verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Why is he bringing up drinking in this context? You know, so for some it seems, boy, that's, that's just kind of out of the blue. Uh, that, that he would bring that up. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it one application of what he's been discussing? Walk as children of light. Walk in wisdom. Don't drink. Does drinking have anything to do with walking as children of light versus walking as children of darkness? Anything to do there? Does drinking have anything to do with walking in wisdom versus walking with the unwise? Is drinking involved in any of that? I mean, think, think about what Proverbs chapter 20. I don't know if Paul had this verse in mind. But Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 is basically couched in the same context that this verse is, where Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, New King James says. And those who are led astray by it are not wise. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Wine mocker, strong drink brawler, led, a, led astray by, by, uh, by that, and you are not wise. What's the context of this verse about drinking? Walk in wisdom. The context of this verse about drinking is, don't walk as fools, but as wise. Don't be unwise, understand what the will of the Lord is. And one of the things that we need to understand is, don't be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, or excess, or riot, or uh, uh, what's another word that's there instead of, Instead of these words. Try and, anybody got a different word there than dissipation? There, there, there are passages in the New Testament that talk about being sober. Uh, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is one of those. And it's interesting, uh, John, that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 through 8, uh, 
you have the same contrast drawn in that passage between light and darkness. And in that contrast between those who are children of light versus those who are children of darkness, again is brought up the matter of drinking and sobriety, even in the, in the midst of that discussion about light and darkness. Uh, and so God, God, is, God draws a line there. He draws a line of contrast between where his children are to be and, and where the world is. Um, now, as you read through this, uh, it's, you know, he, he goes from talking about understanding God's will to not being drunk with wine in verse 18 to then talking in verses 19 and 20 about worship. And sometimes people read through this and they say, wow, he's, he's kind of all over the place uh, in his discussion here. You have a discussion about uh, walking in, in, in wisdom and not as fools, and then you have talking about drinking, then you have a talk about worship. How, why is he talking about all of these things? Um, I, uh, perhaps he has in mind some of the, uh, the cultic, pagan ways of his day where their worship involved uh, drinking, uh, involved drunkenness. And he's, he's introducing this concept of worship to say, let's not have Christian worship, uh, worshiping the one true God doesn't need to follow after these cultic and pagan ways. Uh, and, and so when you get to verse 19, here's a verse that perhaps, uh, perhaps we've heard often in verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. What do we learn about worship in this passage? It involves singing. What? From your heart. So, we, the worship here, it, how do we know he's talking about worship here? How do we know he's not talking about some other subject? Who is involved in verse 19? Is this talking about when you're by yourself? Okay, so, so there, there's, there's a couple elements, and David and Marie mentioned both of these. The last three words you have in verse 19 are what? This is something that is being done to the Lord. Here is something that's being offered as, as a matter of worship to the Lord. Who's involved in it? The beginning of verse 19, who's involved in it? One another. So this is instruction. Here is something that's to transpire. When the church comes together, when they are with one another, and they are offering praise to the Lord, how, how, how is this worship, uh, how is it described? It's described as something that is, that is reciprocal in nature. That everyone is doing it to everyone else. Is that true? You're doing something to one another. When, when, when you... When we see in other verses where we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, who's supposed to bear the burdens? Just certain people? Bear one another's burdens means everybody's bearing everybody else's, everybody's involved. Serve one another, love one another. Uh, uh, all of those one another passages indicate a reciprocal uh, action. So does this involve, it involves everybody. Everybody else singing to everybody else. But ultimately, we're singing to who? Last three words. Ultimately, we're singing to the Lord. But we're also singing to one another. What else do we learn about this? It involves speaking to one another. Over in the parallel verse in Colossians 3 and verse 16, it says, instead of the word speaking, it has teaching and admonishing one another. So, this is to be understandable. The, the, our worship is to be understandable. Our singing is to be understandable. It, it's as you're speaking and as you're teaching each other. This is something that, uh, that is, not, is not just humming. It, it's something that is edifying. It is teaching. It is speaking in a language uh, that is understandable. Uh, and it involves singing and making melody. Where is the melody to be made in this verse? The melody is to be made in your heart. Um, if you go through the entirety of the New Testament and read everything the New Testament has to say about music and Christian worship, it's sort of summed up right here in this verse. 
There's not a single verse in the New Testament that talks about using any kind of a mechanical instrument in New Testament worship. God specifies singing. And by specifying the type of music that he wants in worship, singing, he automatically excludes any other kind of music that would be brought in. And by, and by specifying here the instrument, where's the melody to be made? In your heart. So this is not just saying nice words with your lips. This is first to be generated from the heart before it ever comes out of the lips to offer this praise to God. Um, there's a lot that could be discussed, obviously, on verse 19 and uh, the, the emphasis there on the heart, and the emphasis there on, on singing as a part of worship. Uh, we don't need to lose sight of verse 20 that's involved in this, that we are to be, a part of our worship is to be giving of thanks. Um, that's a part of our worship. That's a part of singing. Um, and interestingly, in that context there, it's even talking about submitting uh, to one another. And so there, there's a... There's a humbling aspect. Uh, if, this, if, that, if that verse is to be included in this, in this worship uh, context here, there is a humbling aspect of it uh, that kind of leads us to serve each other as a, as a part of our worship. But perhaps, perhaps he's indicating or using that as a transition verse into, uh, into verse 22 that we'll see in a second. But anybody have any comments or questions or anything on those verses that we've talked about to this point? Would there be unity? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's, that's what's involved there is, is when he's saying that you're to be speaking to one another, there's a unity in, involved in that, and that backs up into chapter 4 uh, where he began this practical section on the matter that the church is to, is to strive for, to be united together. And uh, it, when you come together and you sing with other Christians, does that unite your hearts together? Uh, you know, when, how, how many of the songs that we sing do we use the pronoun we or the pronoun us? Quite a few of them, right? You know, sometimes we, we say I, I want to be a worker for the Lord. But how often do we say we? Come we that love the Lord and let our, our hearts rejoice. What is that doing? Well, it's me singing, but I'm singing in, in, in unison. I'm singing with one another. So that's a good point. Anybody else got any thoughts or comments? All right, look in verse 22. He kind of shifts gears a little bit here in verse 22 and changes from, from this idea of, of imitating Christ in our walk and, and starts talking about relate the, the domestic relationships that we have with each other and how we can promote harmony uh, within these relationships. And he, whoops, here's the... Uh, did I totally lose that whole PowerPoint? Nate, can you just throw that last screen up? I guess I just killed the whole PowerPoint. Oh, hang on. Maybe I can do it. There. Let's get back over there, and I'll throw those three points up without killing it this time. All right. So this, this section is divided up into three points. Uh, husbands and wives, children and parents, uh, servants and masters. We'll see how far we can get into this. But he spends uh, verses 22 down through the end of chapter 5 talking to husbands and wives. And this section of Scripture, if you are married, this, this is your, your how-to for marriage. And it's not the only section on marriage in the Bible, but it, is, it, it applies to husbands and wives and helps us to understand God's design for marriage. If you're going to get married, you need to read this section and understand what is God's design for marriage. And what's interesting in this section of Scripture is he's talking about husbands and a husband's relationship to his wife. What is he paralleling the husband-wife relationship with? Christ and the church. And so he talks about Christ and the church and the husband and the wife, and he, he, he runs them parallel with each other, and then he, he runs them so parallel with each other that sometimes he's talking about one when he's talking about the other. Uh, and that, that's how much the two relationships are related to each other. And so if husbands, you know, sometimes a man gets married and maybe he didn't have such a good role model for what it means to be a husband. 
Some, hus some guys get married, and they had a great role model for what it means to be a husband, so they just kind of follow uh, in, in, in their role model steps. But some guys get married, they didn't have a good role model for being a husband, so they're like, well, uh, how am I supposed to be a good husband? Same thing could be said for a wife. Uh, maybe a wife didn't have a great role model on what it was to be a, a wife or to be a mother. Guess what Ephesians chapter 5 does for us? It says, great, look at your earthly models uh, and, and follow in, in good models in that way, but who's our ultimate model in the, in the marriage relationship? Here's Christ in the church. And, and that model for us is, uh, is laid out here uh, in, in a parallel and, and in some ways an interchangeable way uh, to talk about that relationship. So in verse 22, remember what verse 21 says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Who is verse 21 addressed to? Is, that, is it addressed to Christians? It's addressed to all Christians, right? Submitting to one another. It is, it is addressed to all Christians uh, to submit to one another, to have a humble serving attitude towards each other. So when you get to verse 22, who's verse 22 addressed to? Wives. And wives are told to submit to your own husbands. This is not the first time we read this word submit in this book or in this chapter. You've got the word right before it that all Christians are to have this attitude. And so God is not singling out per se only the wives to say this is only a responsibility of wives, but he is specifying that this is a responsibility of wives in the, in the marriage relationship to submit to, and don't you like that he says your own husbands? He doesn't say wives submit to husbands. That would stink, wouldn't it? Um, now, except we're all supposed to submit to one another, right? Um, but submit to your own husbands. Now, here's a word that I want you to see throughout the rest of this chapter. It's the word, in my Bible, it's the word after the comma. Wives, submit to your own husbands, comma. What word do you have there? It might be different than what I've got, but it, as. That's a key word in this chapter. You're going to see it in verse 23. You might see the word as there. You're going to see it in verse 24. In fact, my Bible says just as in verse 24. You're going to see it in verse 25, just as. You're going to see it in verse 28, uh, that, that to love as. You're going to see it in verse, what's this verse? Verse 29, just as. You're going to see it in verse 33, as. That's a key word in this context. Why is that a key word in this context? Because the word as is a word that is likening something to something else. That's what the word as means. It's, it is likening, you do this as you do something else, or you do this like unto something else. So in verse 22, it is, submit to your own husbands. Well, like what? Well, g g give, me, give me a mental picture, God, of what it means to submit to my own husband. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So does that mean your husband is the Lord? No, that's not what that means. Um, although Sarah did call Abraham Lord, right? That's what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 teaches. But, but that was with a little L. Okay? Not a big L. This is a big L that you've got in verse 22, right? So, wives, submit to your own husbands as you submit to the Lord. Well, how do you submit to the Lord? You figure out the answer to that, and God says, that's how do you submit to your own husbands. Oh, we don't like this, we don't like this uh, submission uh, concept especially in the 21st century, we don't like it. But do you, think they, do you think it was popular in the first century? But is God saying that one person in a relationship is more important than the other, more valuable? Um, it, it, does God like somebody more than another? Is God picking teams? Is God out on the playground, it's time to pick teams, and, and he wants to pick the husband first, and he doesn't really want the wife on his team? Is, is that what's happening? No. God, is, God formed a relationship. God joined Adam and Eve. He joined the relationship. And in that relationship, God identified roles for each person to have in the relationship. Was one better? Was one more important? Was No. It's that they're just different roles. And so having different roles, what are they? Wife is to submit to her husband. Verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife. Well, there you got it. He's in charge, right? 
He gets to make all the decisions. He gets to tell his wife what to do, where to go, what she can do and what she can't do, what she can say, what she can't say, how much money she can spend and how much money she can't spend. He gets to tell her everything, right? Hmm. That's going to be a fun marriage, right? Does this mean that he's the dictator? Does your Bible say dictator? Uh, it's not the word here. Does it mean that he has authority? Yes, that is the word here. Uh, does it mean that he is responsible? Yes, that's the word here. He's the head of the church, or, or he's the head of the wife, comma. What's the word you have after that? Even as also Christ is the head of the church. What relationship does Christ have with the church? When you figure out the relationship that Christ has with the church, you have figured out the relationship that the husband has to the wife. And Christ is not just the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. In this context about husband-wife relationship, we learn some key details about the Lord's church. We think this context is about husband-wife, head, and submit, and, all, and it is. But we learn some key details about the Lord's church. We learn in verse 23 that Jesus is the head of the church. How many heads does the church have? Uno. There's one, the head of the church. How many churches are there? There's, there's the same number of churches that there are heads, right? Same number of bodies as there are heads, just one. So he is the head of the one church. But he's not just the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. How many bodies are there? Just one. But he's the Savior of the body. Do I have to be in the body? What's the body? Church. Do I have to be in the body in order to be saved? Jesus is the Savior, the one who saves, of the body. Does Jesus, is he the Savior of something outside the body? No. He's the Savior of the ones who are in the body. So do I have to be in the body in order to be saved? That's what that verse teaches. So is the church essential? Can I say, oh, I can just take it or leave it? No. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something that's optional. It's essential. Verse 24, therefore... Just as, there's that expression again, just as the church is subject to Christ, you might draw a line back to submit to your own husbands in verse 22, just as the church is subject to Christ, so, that's a parallel term again, let the wives be to their own husbands. Do you have a period after the word husbands? Well, I don't either. I've got two more words before I get to a period. In everything. So what does that mean? Does that mean that, that husbands just run the show and the wife has to uh, just, just go along and uh, not, have, uh, not have any input into what's happening? You know what a wise husband does? He is quick to hear and slow to speak. That's what a wise anybody does, right? I mean, that's James 1 and verse 19. That's what a wise anybody does. But you know what a wise husband does? He's quick to hear. He's slow to speak. Will, it, will a wise husband listen to his wife? A wise husband better listen to his wife. Read Proverbs 31 sometime and think about the husband-wife relationship and how much respect a husband and how much listening a husband did to his wife in Proverbs 31. Um, there is a, a mutual love and respect that is to exist there. Verse 25, husbands. So verse 22 said, wives, do this. Verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives. Comma, here's your parallel, just as. Here's, here's your mental picture. How much am I supposed to love my wife? Uh, I just love her. I love her on the weekends. Uh, I, I love her when she's nice to me. I love her when she does good stuff for me. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So Jesus only loves the church when the church is nice, right? Jesus only loves the church when... When, when they do nice, good things for him, right? Jesus loved the church before the church ever cared about him. Jesus loved the church so much that he sacrificed himself for her. And what did her, the church, what did she do to deserve his sacrifice? Not a single thing. Husbands, how much do you love your wives? The word love here is not that you, uh, that you have uh, all this... Uh, compassion and affection. That's not the word that's used here. This word is not the word for sex. 
Uh, the word that's used here is, that, is the Greek word agape that says you put your wife above yourself. So here, here's, here's the concept. Wives are to submit to their own husbands, and what are husbands supposed to do? Love their wives with this ultimate agape love that is unselfish, not what the husbands get out of it, unconditional, doesn't matter what the wife does, that sets her ab above and says your interest and your needs are more important than mine. That's what a husband is to do. So does it sound so bad to be a wife in that scenario? No. Now, now is this saying that only Christian husbands are supposed to do that? Or is this say, only saying that husbands are supposed to do that if their wives are Christians? Uh, that's not what I was talking about, right? This involves any husband and any wife and the responsibility of any husband or any wife to their husband or wife, whether their husband or wife is a Christian, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for Why did Jesus, and we learned a little bit about the church here, why did Jesus die for the church? Verse 26, that, here's the purpose, he might sanctify, set her apart, make her holy, and cleanse her. How did the church, or how, yeah, how did the church become cleansed? By the washing of water with the word. How is somebody set apart by God? How is somebody cleansed by God? What is the washing of water all about? It's, you, you, it's, it's amazing what God does here without using the word baptism. What is he talking about? You are sanctified, made holy, and cleansed by the washing of water. People that don't believe that baptism is essential to be cleansed and to made, be made holy have a really hard time explaining what that verse means. Because what's it say? The washing of water. You put washing of water in the New Testament, and what does washing of water in the New Testament, what is that even talking about? If it's not talking about baptism, it has no meaning at all. Well, of course it's talking about baptism. You put that in the context of, of John 3 and verse 5, where Jesus says, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Guess what this is? This verse is saying the same thing. We are, we are sanctified, we are cleansed by the washing of water and with the Word. Where would the Word come from? The Holy Spirit of God. So John 3 and verse 5 and, he, and Ephesians 5 verse 26 are parallel. That a man is born of water and the Spirit, he is cleansed by water and the Word, which is given to us by the Spirit. And he's cleansed when he's baptized. He's added to the church when he's baptized. Verse 27, that Jesus might present her to himself, a glorious church. She doesn't have spot. She doesn't have wrinkle. She doesn't have anything like that. But she should be holy. She's sanctified in verse 26. She should be without blemish. She's been washed in verse 26. So you have a beautiful picture of what a husband did for his wife. He died for her so that she could be saved, so that she could be cleansed and sanctified and made holy. What a beautiful picture. Is the, are we married to Christ? If we are a Christian... We are a member of the body of Christ. We are married to Christ. The Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ, and that's what it's doing here. We are married to Christ. He has, he has done that in order that we might uh, have this relationship with Him. First word you've got in verse 28 is what? So. so. All right, so here's that picture of what Jesus has done for His bride. Verse 28, so... In other words, like that, husbands. So husbands ought to love their own wives. There it is for husbands, too. Husbands, don't you dare love somebody else's wife. You don't have any authority to love somebody else. You love your own wife. And don't worry about those other women. Husbands ought to love their own wives. I've got the word as here. As their own bodies. Well, why would they do that? Because he who loves his wife... Loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh. What does a husband do? What does a man do? Takes care of himself. What does he need to do for his wife? 
take care of her. What does he do for himself? The end of verse, uh, middle of verse 29. He typically nourishes and cherishes himself. He takes care. What is he supposed to do for his wife? Nourish his wife, cherish his wife. Comma. Do you have just as in your Bible at the end of verse 29? Here it is again. Lord, how much am I supposed to nourish and cherish my wife? What if she's, what if she's mean to me? What if she's hateful to me? What if she says stuff to me that, that's just not right? The church would never do that to Jesus, right? Nourish and cherish just as the Lord does. How much does the church? How much does Jesus nourish and cherish the church? You figure out the answer to that question, and you figured out how much a husband is to nourish and cherish his wife. For we are members, verse 30, of his body of his flesh and of his bones, New King James says. And so Paul quotes in verse 31 the premier verse about marriage. What, what verse is he quoting in verse 31? You have a footnote, marginal note? He's quoting from Genesis 2 and verse 24. The premier foundational verse about marriage is all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. Why is that the premier foundational verse about marriage? That's when marriage was established. That's when God started marriage and God nailed down the foundation for every marriage at the first marriage when he said, so then for this reason a man's going to leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. And those two shall become one flesh. Paul was not the only one to quote that verse in the New Testament. Do you know who else quoted that verse in the New Testament? Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 quoted that verse. Here's the premier foundational verse about marriage that Jesus and Paul both quote. And so marriage is not some cultural anomaly, not some, something that man created. God created it. And when God created it, he, he, gave, uh, he gave the foundational truth and premise and regulation for marriage that would be for all time. Not just in the Old Testament, not just the New Testament, not just for some cultural event, but this God's God's plan for marriage, his design for marriage, has not changed from the beginning. And so in Matthew 19, when man came and asked Jesus, hey, can we divorce our wives for any reason? Jesus says, let's go back to the beginning and see how God created marriage to start with. That's how he wanted it from the beginning, and it has not changed. And so marriage is between a man and his wife. And how many are involved in marriage? The two. And who are the two in marriage? The man and his wife, a male and a female, and they become one flesh. There's some state now that's now going to put on the birth certificate. They can be a male, they can be a female, or they can be something else on the birth certificate. I don't know what you come up with for something else on that birth certificate when that baby comes out. It's pretty clear what that baby is when that baby comes out, right? So you've got a, in marriage, you've got a man and you've got a woman. The two become one flesh. There's only one other party that's involved in that marriage. God. God. And that's it. Richard? God has such a high esteem for marriage that he established it before man ever did. That's right. Now, Richard said he, God had such a high esteem for marriage that, uh, that he established it before man ever sinned. And so here, when Paul's talking about how does, how does God view marriage, how, what's he parallel, paralleling it with? He's paralleling it with the relationship between Christ and the church. So verse 32, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm talking about husband-wife relationship, and there's application here. But what's, what's the one word summary of the book of Ephesians? Church. That's what he says here. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular, husbands, love his own wife, not somebody else's, love his own wife, I've got the word as here again, as himself. And let the wife see that she respects or reverences, your Bible might say fears. Uh, the word fear there is not to be afraid, to, to, to cower in, uh, in, in some kind of uh, uh, fear of him, but is to, is, is to be a respectful relationship between uh, that husband and his wife, just as one would see the relationship between Jesus and his church. Let's see if we can look at the first four verses of the next chapter. We've got, uh, we've got three minutes, and I think we can do that. So he's addressed the relationship between husbands and wives. And then the next four verses of chapter, the first four verses of chapter four, 
addresses this relationship between children and their parents. I've already noted that by addressing children that they must have been able to understand what he was saying. They must have been able to follow it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. What does that mean? As long as your parents' commandments are in uh, consistent following with the will of God and don't violate God's will, what are children supposed to do? Well, they're so unfair. They make me go to bed at such and such an hour. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is what? Right. And it's always right to what? Do what your parents say. It's always right to do right. Obey your parents in the Lord. So that's command number one is obey. Command number two in verse two is what? Honor. Is obeying your parents different than honoring your parents? I mean, they, they, they go together, right? But they have a different flavor to them, don't they? Can you obey without honoring? Can you honor without obeying? You could. You could try. But you got to do both. Obey your parents. Honor, and, and obviously, in verses 2 and 3, he's quoting, uh, and depending on how your Bible denotes quotations uh, from the Old Testament, he's quoting from Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments. So, uh, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Why should you honor your father and mother? So that they don't kill you. That's what verse 3 says, isn't it? That it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. You obey your parents, you honor them, so that you can have a good life. If you don't obey your parents, and you don't honor them, well, what did they do with rebellious children under the old law? Come here, son. Come here, son. You're going to speak to me in that tone? You're going to rebel against me? Come here, son. Let, 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 let's go down and, and have a chat. So, literally under the old law, you obey your parents and you honor your parents so that you can live. That's a, that's a novel idea. What about parents? We, got, we just got a couple seconds here. What about parents in verse 4? And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. What does that mean? Does that mean you can't have rules? No. What are they supposed to obey if you don't have rules? You're supposed to have rules. Can we sometimes be unreasonable? If we're unreasonable, we need to uh, check ourselves. doesn't mean rules are not reasonable, but we need to check ourselves, see, are we being reasonable? Uh, are we being abusive? Obviously, that's, that, that would not be uh, appropriate, and that would be provoking in a situation. Uh, is it possible that uh, we can uh, be uneven in the treatment of our children? Whatever it might be, don't provoke your children to anger or wrath, but... Bring them up in the training. You might have the word discipline there. And that's, discipline's not talking about just correction. It's not talking about just spanking, although that would be included. Bring them up in the training, discipline, and the admonition, the instruction, the warning of the Lord. So parents have a responsibility to bring their children up in the Lord. And children have a responsibility to obey their parents in the Lord. And on Sunday, we're going to talk about what's the secret to happiness in every home. Well, we're not going to look at Ephesians 6, I don't think. At least that's not my plan right now. But uh, doesn't that bring happiness to every home? If parents do their part and children do their part in the Lord, that ought to bring happiness to every home. Thank you all for your good attention. We'll pick up in verse 5 next time and uh, finish up the book.